Welcome to the introduction to the computational chemistry playlist. So computational chemistry could be defined as the use of computers to solve the equations of a theory or model for the properties of chemical systems. So in science, we're very familiar with the kind of twin branches of science, both experiment and theory, where uh, in theory you make predictions which are falsifiable. So you make claims which can either be demonstrated to be true or false during an experiment, which are specific predictions made due to the uh, models introduced in a theory. An experiment tests those theories. It rejects theories that are incorrect it, it allows us to narrow down the scope under which a theory is either uh, correct or incorrect. And a third pillar, which is rapidly emerging to become uh, quite, quite comparable in magnitude in terms of the volume of research produced, is simulation. So theory, we kind of think of more in terms of the kind of pencil and paper, conceptual idea making uh, sort of... Uh, you know, what nuts and bolts of the equations, whereas sometimes these equations form uh, very complicated mathematics, sometimes it's difficult to solve, sometimes the conclusions of these theories aren't always obvious. So instead of trying to, you know, use them in an experiment, we assist this process by doing some simulations. So computational chemistry is kind of just the the use of simulations in the context of chemistry. Okay, so as I said, theory kind of generates equations for simulations to solve. Simulations give solutions to those equations, which then allow us to uh, help this feedback loop of experiment uh, testing theory. And also sometimes experimental data are quite complicated. Sometimes if you have spectra or other types of experimental data, they might be very complicated and you might want to use a simpler model system and simulate the results of that for the same kind of spectrum or whatever kind of experimental results you want. And then that model system might help you to interpret that particular experiment and help to uh, either uh, narrow down towards or throw out some possibilities for how we might interpret this experiment. Additionally, sometimes there are free parameters in these equations of the theory. So values which we don't, which we are, you know, free to set to different values and experiment can help us refine these simulations when we're giving solutions to the theory for choosing some uh, what are called empirical parameters, parameters that we would get from experiment. Okay, so those three branches of science all kind of feed into one another, and simulation is particularly the part that we're in, most interested in in this course. And so I discussed theory, and I also said in there a few times the word model. So sometimes those are used somewhat interchangeably. Um, sometimes you might define them where one is sort of the um, you know, falsifiable predictions and the other being uh, a model being a simplified representation of a physical system. So in general chemistry, when we think about uh, molecules as balls and sticks, where the atoms are balls and the, and the covalent bonds are sticks, that is a model of a molecule. Uh, we're going to show other models of molecules that are going to be more in mathematical terms and some other visual models that will use some uh, visual software programs to represent some of the output of our simulations. Okay, so as I mentioned, simulation is becoming a bigger and bigger part of the scientific in world and engineering as well, and that's because of advances in the past several decades, uh, many of which have allowed simulations to be orders of magnitude more powerful than they used to be. So one of those, Moore's Law, from about the 1950s to the early 2000s, um, the amount, the number of uh, transistors in silicon chips was doubling about every one to two years. So essentially, our computing power on a single computer was, a, was doubling every one to two years, which comes out to be about a factor of a thousand every two decades. So there was a dramatic increase in computing power from uh, every decade that preceded it during the late 20th century. 
that's since uh, started to uh, started to decay out as we're reaching sort of the uh, the atomic limits of how small we can make these things and chips. So now what's be, what's starting to be used more and more is parallel computing, using multiple computers, multiple processors, multiple chips simultaneously to work on a problem uh, to try to get some more throughput and be able to uh, simulate uh, more powerful uh, systems. So whether that's simulating a larger system, simulating for a greater amount of time, a greater amount of a greater uh, size of the system, lots of possibilities there. Additionally, hardware is orders of magnitude cheaper than it was um, just several years ago. So, um, you know, a one megabyte, one million bytes of storage in, in uh, 50 years ago would probably have cost you millions of dollars. And now terabytes of storage, trillions of bytes of storage cost you pennies. Sometimes you even get um, that amount for free on various kind of uh, web server type applications. So we have <clears throat> uh, much more powerful processors, lots of processors working together. Um, these processors and computational hardware in general is getting very cheap, especially relative to what it was. And we also have better software. So the field of algorithms and uh, how to write software, all those things have, and better better theories with uh, clever mathematical approximations, we're getting much better at writing better software that is able to uh, do these simulations in, a, in using less amount of processing power. So those four together, combined with many other factors, have made simulation really a, a, a central part of science now. And these properties that you might be simulating here during you know, any kind of test of a theory, any kind of interpretation of experiment, that could be really any property that you can measure in an experiment you can simulate if you know well enough the theory behind what generates uh, those experimental properties. So very frequently that'll be things like uh, energies, structures, spectra, so maybe IR spectra, NMR, UV vis, microwave, Anything that you can measure from uh, um, a spectrum, you can compute. Uh, structures, things like equilibrium bond lengths, uh, protein folded, folded protein structures, uh, larger macromolecules, or any kind of energy of interest like free energy, equilibrium constants, reaction rates, things related to energy, all those can be simulated as well. So in time, we'll talk about all of these in our computational chemistry playlist here. And we'll start off with some of uh, introductory applications and then start looking at some simpler models and build our way up from there up until uh, models which are being used uh, very, very frequently today.